So Raspberry Pi has released a new computer, the Pi 500 Plus. And for me, it's the most exciting release since probably well, the Raspberry Pi 3 when they moved from 32-bit to 64-bit. I'm going to dive into everything you need to know in this video. So if you want to find out more, please let me explain. So the Pi 500 Plus is the bigger sibling to the Pi 500. It uses the same processor as the Pi 500, but it's also the same processor as the Raspberry Pi 5 and the Compute Module 5. So what does that mean? You've got a Broadcom processor, which gives you a quad-core Cortex A76 CPU set up at 2.4 gigahertz. You've then got dual-band Wi-Fi, Bluetooth 5, gigabit Ethernet, a variety of USB ports. You've got a micro SD card. You've got those 40 GPIO pins and it's powered by a five volt, five amp USB-C connector. So that makes it very similar to the Pi 500, but where you get three big differences, first and most obvious one, of course, is this wonderful mechanical keyboard, which under every key there is a programmable LED and that just has so many amazing possibilities uh, connected with that and we'll go more into that in a minute. I've got to show you some demos that I've written myself showing you some of the things you can do with those LEDs. You get 16 gigabytes of RAM, so that's more than you get in the Pi 500. Now you can get a 16 gigabyte version of the Raspberry Pi 5. You get that also in the Pi 500. Plus, and you get 256 gigabytes of SSD storage via an M2 slot, which is on the motherboard, and I'll show you that in a minute as well. Let's dive into this keyboard. A wonderful mechanical keyboard really does make this a sweet bit of equipment, and having those programmable LEDs just gives you so many different possibilities. There are some built in modes which you can access by pressing the FN key and F4, that will cycle you through the different modes. In one of the modes, you can change the hues using the FN key and F3. And if you want to go backwards through the mode, you just do Shift and FN and S4. And look at these modes, they're just so beautiful. Now the keyboard can also be controlled via a command line tool that you get. This gives you access to set different modes. In fact, there's lots of different things you can do with the firmware on the keyboard, keyboard mappings and so on. And you can also access it via Python. Now accessing it via Python, I've written some various scripts. I'll put these all in my GitHub repository. So you can just change uh, the colors. You can change them to different patterns. I've got one example here, disk go, which just flashes all kinds of random patterns. You can make more kind of smooth patterns, different areas of the keyboard. But more than that, you can actually use this for different things. So for example, here's a clock. So here's a clock running. One row shows you the hour. The next one shows you the minutes. They kind of flash up in order. And there's a row that also shows you the seconds uh, going past. More than that, you can make a binary clock. So here's a binary clock running. Uh, I won't go into binary clocks now, but I hope you can notice there the binary patterns changing for the hours, minutes, and seconds there on the keyboard. Another interesting idea is you can use it like a process monitor. So I'm thinking of top, htop, those commands you can run from the command line. Here I've got them running on a keyboard. So as you're doing different things, for example, all the CPU cores being use, you're going to get maximum uses there. Uh, one CPU core being used, you can see that being used, and just general use. You can see how the different cores are being used as uh, you just do different things like running the web browser, uh, using uh, you know, YouTube, and, and so on. So let's take it apart. Pretty easy. Some screws here on the back. You've also got a tool for uh, separating it in the kit that you buy. You pop open the back. Now the ribbon cable is quite long, so it shouldn't be a problem, but do notice there is a ribbon cable connecting the two parts together. And there inside you can see that NVMe drive. Now if you remember back to the Pi 500, it had the solder pads for this there, but there was no NVMe drive. And I said at the time, oh, I wonder what's coming. I wonder if this was an abandoned thing or whether they had plans for it. They do have plans for it. It's the Pi 500 Plus. And you can see there, you can upgrade the SSD there pretty simply and it accepts different sizes. So that's absolutely brilliant. Let's take off the heat sink and we can see under here, the motherboard, very similar to what we had in the Pi 400, what we have in the Pi 500, what we now have in the Pi 500 Plus with the different chips there, including the Broadcom, processor including the rp1 chip and then of course all the ports sold there on the back and so on so really neat design passive 
cooling with that big heat sink, absolutely fantastic. So what can you do with a Pi 5? Well, it's a fully fledged computer. You connect up a, a mouse, connect it up to a monitor, so you can browse the web, anything you'd expect with inside a web browser. You've got a choice between Chrome and Firefox. You can watch YouTube. You can create Office documents via LibreOffice. So you've got normal documents, you've got slides, you've got spreadsheets and so on programming, C, Python, Rust, whatever it is you want to do, you can do that. Databases, containers, there's emulation, of course, retro gaming, photo editing. You can watch movies, you can listen to music. And then, of course, on top of all that, you've got access to those 40 GPIO pins, which means you can connect sensors, servos, LEDs, displays, relays, and so on. And I've got lots of videos here on this channel talking about all the different things you connect to the GPIO pins on a Raspberry Pi. So I won't go into that now. Okay, so let's quickly talk about power usage when you boot it up and everything's kind of come up and you're on the desktop. It will use between 2.4 and 3 watts. This is on Wi-Fi, not on Ethernet. And then, of course, the LEDs make a big difference. If you then turn on that bright white pattern on the keyboard 100%, the, and it's not doing anything software wise, it's still idle on the desktop, you're gonna get six watts of power draw. If you lower that keyboard usage to about 50%, uh, then you get three watts power draw. If you switch it to a pattern, uh, one of those swirling patterns that's built in, 100% brightness, 4.3 watts. If you reduce that down to 50%, three watts. And then if you are watching a YouTube video, 1080p without the keyboard on at all, so the keyboard LEDs are off, five watts, and then if you combine all of that, watching a 1080p YouTube video and 100% bright white keyboard, it's gonna draw between 9.5 and 10 watts. Again, all on Wi-Fi, if you do this on ethernet, the average might go down by, let's say, half a watt or so. And then finally, if you shut it down, everything shut down, but it's still plugged in, then it's gonna draw about 0.2 watts. Okay, a couple of more things to mention before we close out. One is that you can change the keycaps on the mechanical keyboard. In fact, they even give you a keycap extraction tool to help you do that. And it's gonna be interesting to see what people do with that idea uh, once these things hit the shelves. And talking of hitting the shelves, let's just talk about price and availability. It's available now and it costs $200 uh, or whatever the equivalent that's going to be in your local currency. Okay, that's it. Love to hear what your thoughts are about this in the comments. If you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up and don't forget to stick around by subscribing to the channel. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>